Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for joining. Really pleased to welcome you to this webinar today. Um, thanks for waiting a couple of minutes. It's always nice to wait to make sure that as many people have joined as possible. Um, my name's Jess and um, I'm gonna be hosting the webinar today and you'll also um, meet a couple of other people um, from the Future Minds and Differing Minds teams. Um, so I am the CEO at Differing Minds um, and uh, Differing Minds is the organization which um, kind of uh, came up with the Future Minds initiative, which you'll hear a lot more about today. Um, I'm also joined, um, as I said, by a couple of members of the team that you'll hear from um, as we go through the session. So it's about an hour today um, and we will leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A functionality and we will um, get to those at the end of the session. So in terms of the agenda, what we're going to talk through today is a little bit about the school experience currently for neurodivergent children. Um, we'll then move on to talk about um, our Future Minds lesson and, and what we've done to date. And then finally, um, we will talk about how schools can access the lesson and the different options that you have. Um, and for, uh, right at the end, we will, as I said, facilitate a QA. and a um, Don't feel like you need to wait until the end. Feel free to put Q&A in, um, in, in the, the Q&A functionality um, at any point throughout the webinar. So for those of you that um, I, I'm hoping that most of you are aware of the term neurodiversity and are, um, understand kind of what we mean by neurodivergent children, but just for those that may not, when we're talking about neurodiversity, we're talking about the difference in our brains. Um, and specifically the difference that comes um, sometimes as a result of having a neurological condition, such as being autistic, um, being ADHD, being dyslexic, et cetera. Um, and so when we talk about um, supporting neurodivergent children, we're talking about children who have those neurological differences. So Future Minds was born actually not that long ago. So the earlier parts of this year, um, we had an idea that we wanted to look into and we've been really lucky to be supported by an amazing team of people who work at Differing Minds, but also people who work kind of outside of Differing Minds um, in different areas. We've had lots of support from lots and lots of different people, but here you'll see the kind of key people that have been working on this project. Um, so other than myself, we have Emily, who you will hear from very shortly. Emily is actually our Future Minds project manager. So she is the lead on this and kind of helps us to coordinate and has helped enormously to get us to the point that we're at right now. We also have Sadie, who is the autism lead at Brighton and Hove, Hove Inclusion Support Service, otherwise known as BIS. And again, you'll be hearing from Sadie further along in the session. We've also had the support from um, Louise, who is a teacher who is taught in both mainstream and in a um, special school. Um, we have Becky, who is the chair of the Parent and Carers Council in Brighton and Hove. Um, and we have Steve, who is um, another director at Differing Minds, um, and he works on everything creative. So he has led in terms of our videos and, and all of the colourful things you'll see as we work through um, this talk today. So what I want to do now is, is pass over to Emily um, to talk a little bit more about her experience as a neurodivergent person and child in school. Um, Emily is a co-director at Differing Minds. Um, she also runs her own um, business called Emily Autism and Me. And she's a wonderful autism advocate and also has other neurological differences as well. Um, and I think listening to her perspective of what it was like for her at school is an amazing way to really set the scene and to understand why an initiative like this is, is so important. So over to you, Emily. Thank you, Jess. So as Jess said, I am neurodivergent. Um, I didn't know it at the time I was at school. So school was a, an interesting time being a, a neurodivergent child um, and not always knowing I was a neurodivergent child. Um, I was labelled as the school refuser. That was kind of the, the term that I got when I was at school um, because I would get to the gate and that would be it. I would scream, I would cling to my mum, I would do absolutely everything possible to not get in that building. Um, most of the time people did get me in the building, um, particularly at primary school um, when I was a bit smaller, <laughs> it was a bit easier to get me into school. 
Um, but my peers, my friends didn't understand why I made, to them, I was making just a big fuss. Like it's school, you sit down, you do English, you do maths. Like I didn't struggle with English or maths. So I don't think I, any of them really got, you know, why does she struggle to come into school? Why is it this big deal just getting through the gates? Um, one of my oldest friends was always like, come on, Emily, come on, you can do it. It's fine. It's fine. Um, which I suppose was the, the narrative shared by my teachers of she's absolutely fine at school. Um, the reality was far from me being fine at school. So once we'd had the, the what I now know is a meltdown outside the school gates, it would be trying to transition into working on the carpet. It would be you know, trying to concentrate on what I was doing in terms of maybe it was times tables and having this timed pressure and trying to achieve what I, I could. And I knew I was good at maths, my one autism stereotype potentially, um, very good at maths. But the, as soon as you put a timed pressure on me, that was it. I couldn't cope with it. And it, I found it really difficult. And again, peers being like, what's, you know, we all do times tables, timed tests which is a bit of a mouthful actually to try and say that, but you know, what's wrong with you? Like, wh why do you have, you know, such a, a thing about trying to do these things under pressure? Why do you have a thing about not wanting to come into school? Why is it the second that the bell goes for break time or play time or lunch time, whatever it was, why do you immediately go to the teacher and think of any excuse to not leave that classroom? Um, I found playtimes and trying to navigate that kind of social interaction incredibly challenging and and not being understood and and just didn't know how to interact with with other children and it being a loud environment um I didn't go to a particularly large primary school but it didn't make it any less daunting trying to interact with all these things going on you know you've got football you've got tennis balls you've got all these things going on and I just couldn't navigate it and um, so I was quite often found in the um, classroom cleaning paint palettes because that's what I did um, I'm sure I mean many times I was described as every teacher's dream probably because I was very quiet when I was actually in class and at play times I washed up um, so I didn't really cause much of a fuss um, I'll end by telling one particular story of as I got older, it got harder and harder for that process to get through that school gate. Um, and that got to the point where I would miss months of school. Um, on one particular occasion, I had missed two months of school and I came back in. And again, the children didn't understand. My peers had no idea why I'd been absent for so long. It hadn't been talked about neurodiversity. Well, everyone always told me neurodiversity wasn't a thing when you were at school. I always say it was because I was there. Um, but the teacher left the room on this particular occasion and all 30 children stood up, crowded around me and went, where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? And that was it. I couldn't go into class for the rest of the day. So if my peers had understood me as a neurodivergent child or even just a child who had differences, particularly 25 years ago, School would have been a much better experience for me um, and that's why I'm so passionate about this Future Minds project um, is to just make that difference um, so that other neurodivergent children don't have the experiences that I had um, when I was at school. Um, I'm going to hand you back over to Jess. Thanks so much Emily. Um, thanks for sharing your story. Um, not, not an uncommon one when we um, talk to neurodivergent children and obviously Emily was at school some time ago um, but things haven't dramatically changed since then so um, again really interesting to hear her perspective on how things were when she was at school. Um, this graph here is from a report that someone called Chris Bonello has done. Um, Chris Bonello goes under the pseudonym um, autistic not weird um, and he is a brilliant autistic advocate he is also he's either a current teacher or former teacher I forget um, but really worth looking into the work that Chris does 
Um, one of the things he did earlier on this year was to um, do a study um, and then a report on the study that he'd done with um, 11,000 people. Um, and specifically, he asked them in this case about their experience at school, which I think is really interesting to look at. So he asked people to agree or disagree with the statements that you see here. So my experience at school was positive. And sadly, you can see here that only 13% of autistic students said they had a positive experience at school. So that's really, really low. And to touch on the point that we just raised just now was he separated that by people responding of all ages and people responding who were kind of currently of school age to see if there was a difference and see if we were heading in the right direction. And whilst those who were younger and at school age um, agreed more, it's very, very, very slight. So actually, um, the, the marginal improvement may be down to nothing more than kind of a little bit of an anomaly. Um, and so it really shows that there's huge work to do to improve um, the school environment and school lives for, in this case, autistic children. But I think it's much broader than that and it's for neurodivergent children in total. We also know when you look at the numbers that this relates quite strongly to absence from school. And um, from a study done pre-COVID, um, but I imagine it doesn't look hugely different now, 40% of those children who were persistently absent from school um, were autistic or who, who had other neurodivergent needs or conditions. And also um, pupils with a SEND statement or an EHCP were more than twice as likely to have a persistent absence rate when compared to their peers who had no identified SEN. Um, you have 24.6% for those with SEN and 9% for those without. So it's quite a significant difference. So all this tells us that there's definitely work to do to improve the lives of neurodivergent children in school and something that we're really committed to playing our part in at Different Minds. So what can we do to improve the school lives and the well-being and ultimately education of neurodivergent children? Well, whilst there are huge amounts of things that we can all do, that schools can do, that society can do. We believe that one of the really key things to do to support this is to teach all children about neurodiversity. As Emily touched on when she was talking through her story, um, a lot, not all, but a lot of the issues she faced was because her peers didn't understand her. It actually turns out that Emily didn't necessarily understand herself at that time, given she was a late diagnosed autistic woman. But if her peers had understand a understood a little bit more about difference and how that can kind of present in a classroom and in a school environment, it could have such a fundamental impact on our neurodivergent children in schools. So we decided to launch our initiative called Future Minds, which is all about exactly what we've just said, teaching all children about neurodiversity, not just neurodivergent children, but neurotypical children too. And what this kind of culminated into was a whole class lesson um, that is focused um, or targeted at children aged eight to 11. Um, and it teaches them the real basics of neurodiversity in a very accessible way. So critically, this lesson was developed with the inclusion of lived experience. So we have I think, well over 50% of the people involved in the project so far are neurodivergent themselves. Um, and it's meant that the lesson has been created um, kind of from the mindset of a neurodivergent person, child, but also um, we have worked with neurotypical people too to make sure that the lesson kind of resonates and makes sense for neurotypical children as well. So when we first started thinking about doing this, we wanted to make sure that we had a set of principles that we could stick to that would make sure that this lesson came about in the way that we hoped it would. And they were firstly for it to be positive. So everything we do frames neurodiversity in a positive way, um, frames it in the way that it's a natural part of our human variation and is something that should be celebrated. And we try to get that across to children in, in a really kind of positive way. Secondly, that um, it's digestible. So obviously importantly for children, especially as young as um, ages eight to 11, you need things to be really digestible so that they can understand it, digest it and remember it. So a lot of the things that you'll see that we do um, are catered kind of towards that. So we have a series of videos, 
um, and they are really digestible short videos as opposed to things that take too long for children to kind of process. Thirdly, we want it to be inclusive. We couldn't develop a lesson that teaches children about neurodiversity without that lesson being inclusive of all children's needs and all children's individuality. And finally, we wanted it to be engaging. So the lesson has some wonderful exercises in it, as I said, some great videos, and the whole concept and the way that it's taught is, um, we believe, um, in a really, really engaging way. We also set some really clear goals that we wanted this lesson to achieve. So first of all, we want to increase children's understanding of neurodiversity. So it can't go into too much, de much depth because it's one lesson, but we really want children to come away with a kind of understanding of what neurodiversity is at a very basic level. We wanted to create a positive environment. So we wanted the school to become a positive place for neurodivergent children and for their peers to be able to play a part in that. And then finally, we wanted to increase kind of peer support and inclusion and inclusive action of neurotypical children um, as they support their neurodivergent peers. So a lot of the things that we look at is how children can support their friends um, and their classmates um, with their different needs. And then when we were thinking about pulling this lesson together, we centered it around two core themes. So we actually moved it away from being really about kind of the intricacies of neurodiversity and moved it into the themes of looking at fairness. So again, as we go through what we have put into the lesson, you'll see how fairness comes through and how we kind of teach equality versus equity in a really, really uh, child-friendly way. And then the second theme is all about celebrating difference. So it's not just about neurodiversity, but it's about celebrating all of our difference in a way that means children can be really positive about children and their classmates being different to them and why that's a great thing for their classroom, why that's a great thing for their friendship groups and why that's a great thing for society as a whole. So what does the lesson look like? So based on those principles and those goals and the themes that we develop, our lesson is a kind of really interactive activity based lesson. So we have a number of activities. We have a number of stories in there that the children get to talk through and figure out what they would do in certain scenarios or how they would question certain scenarios. We have kind of physical activities. We have things for the children to look at and to play with and to touch and feel. And we also use um, videos, short videos. So we wanted to make sure that we mix up, mixed up the formats um, so that children were learning in lots of different ways. And it wasn't a very static kind of sort of stale lesson. It's, it's full of lots of different ways of learning and caters to lots of different learning needs. So one of the first exercises that we do with the children is we look at the difference between things being fair and things being equal. And the way that we start to do this is we, we give them a set, we put them in groups and we give them a set of fidget toys. And we ask them to divide up in those their groups the fidget toys that they've been given. And first of all, we ask them to divide them up equally. And secondly, we ask them to divide them up fairly. And then we ask them, what's the difference? And Interestingly, we tried this lesson before we did it in schools um, with a group of adults, which was um, really, really interesting for us to see how as adults we start to tackle those kind of questions. And it was so interesting to see how concepts that we intuitively know about and understand, actually, when you try to articulate them, can be a little bit challenging. Um, and then when we did it in schools, it was amazing to see the different things that the children were coming up with. So very easily, they were able to separate things equally. You know, it was all about numbers. They wanted to make sure everybody had the same amount. And if there were any left over, they just put them aside. And more or less, every group in every trial lesson that we did, did it in that way. Um, but when we asked them to divide up those toys fairly, they had a number of different ways that they chose to do it, which was really, really interesting to see. So some children, for example, they uh, put all of the toys out and they, they took turns by choosing their favourite one. So they kind of went around the group and they kept going round until all of the toys were divided up, but 
all of the children got kind of more of what they wanted than what they didn't. Um, another group um, decided to put the big fidget toys together and the small fidget toys together, and then they divided those up. So everybody got an equal amount of the small ones and an equal amount of the large ones. But what it really did was it enabled a really, really great conversation between the children and then between the entire class when we brought them back together that got them to recognize the difference between things being fair and things being equal. And why in some cases, actually doing things equally might not be the right way to do things. And actually perhaps we should focus on things being fair because that often gives people more of what they need and want. And what I'm gonna show next is the first of our videos, which kind of looks at the difference in our brains and hopefully gives you a bit of a flavor of kind of what we cover with the children and, and how that looks for them. Our brains help us see, hear, think, know that we're hungry, feel heat and cold, and do lots of other cool jobs. They take in information, process it, react to it, and store it in their memories, ready to use next time. For example, when you need to move, your brain sends a signal to your body to move. When you need to listen to a story, your ears send a signal to your brain to understand the words and meaning. Imagine your brain is like a map with the information being carried around on the roads. All our brains look and form differently. Some take in information quickly. Some information may get stuck or lost or sent in a different direction. How do you think your brain works? So a big thank you um, to Steve, our creative director, um, for pulling that video together. And also um, for uh, B, who was the little girl who um, did the voiceover for us. Um, and what I think this video does is kind of just get the children thinking about the way that their own brain works and also understanding that that's different to some of their peers, but in a really child friendly, accessible way. Um, and the video is actually particularly were viewed really positively by the teachers as well as the children. Um, so I hope you agree um, that, that that's kind of an interesting way for us to be teaching them. And one of the other ways that we talk about our brains and the difference in our brains and get the children to kind of see how people can see things differently is through optical illusions. So here we use two of the examples that we use in, 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 the, class, in the lesson. Um, the, the one on the right, I'm, I'm sure you've seen before, the kind of rabbit um, duck image, but also what was very interesting when we were talking to the children was some people said rabbit, some people said duck, some people said they could see both, and some people came up with lots of other things that they could see as well. And it actually really encouraged the children to start to find different things that they might be able to see. Um, and again, it facilitated a really nice conversation about, well, who's right and which is the right answer? Um, and in fact, that there was no right or wrong answer. Um, and the picture of the dress here um, is, is a really, really common image that's shown. I'm sure lots of you on this call will have seen it before. So this is not necessarily about what you see, but what colors you see. So some people will see this dress as white and gold, and some people will see this dress as blue and black, and others may see it as a different color altogether. And this, dress was shared on the internet and went viral a number of years ago and it completely exploded and caused huge debate and it's so interesting to see this in the classroom and for children to start kind of seeing seeing things very very differently to their peers and what was really interesting about this example was with this one particularly um because of how the image is and I'm not sure of the science behind it Often when you can see one set of colors, you physically cannot see the other set. So with the rabbit duck example, sometimes if, if you can see a duck um, and you can't see the rabbit, but someone then explains the rabbit to you, you can kind of start to see it. Um, but in the case of the colors, 
I, for example, see this as white and gold. And I know some people see it as blue and black, but it doesn't matter what I do, I cannot see that dress as blue and black. And so that made for a really, really interesting discussion about, well, actually, even if you can't see it the way that your friend sees it, does that mean that they're wrong? Um, and there was a wonderful moment in one of our trial lessons where the teacher had stepped out of the room for a moment um, and not the teacher, sorry, I should say teaching the, le the Future Minds lesson, but the, the regular teacher from the class had stepped out to deal with something and came back as we were showing this image on the screen. And we were talking about, I think, how, how I was talking or someone was talking about how they could see it white and gold. And she said, no, you can't. That's blue and black. And she couldn't she couldn't see that it was any other color. And so the children were then able to have this amazing conversation with her that allowed her to understand that actually we were all seeing this really, really differently. And so it's an amazing way of demonstrating to the children that we all see things differently. There's not always a wrong or right way of seeing things and that we should always kind of accept how other people are seeing things. And the fact that seeing things differently is a good thing because it means that we can move a lot of things forward in society, come up with new ideas um, and be a lot more innovative than if everybody saw things in the same way. So next, I'm going to show you our second video that we use in the lesson, which teaches the children what neurodiversity is. Two brains can see the same thing, but process and react to this in different ways because they work differently. You can think of this by imagining all our maps being different. Some paths are longer or shorter, wider or narrower, and might have bumps and turns, whereas others don't. Some paths may go in different directions. This difference in our brains is called neurodiversity. When someone's brain processes a lot of things in a different way to most other people, or their maps are significantly different to others, we might say they are neurodivergent. Some people get identified as having a particular type of neurodivergence. For example, they may be autistic or have ADHD or be dyslexic or have Tourette's syndrome. There are many different types of neurodivergence, some of which you may have heard of and some may be new to you. People who have one or more of these differences are different in some ways, but they are also the same in many other ways. We can't always see the differences that neurodiversity creates. Do you think it's better to have lots of different brains in our world? Or would it be better if we were all the same? So this video and the kind of path analogy is a really good way of explaining to children kind of uh, at a basic level how their brains work and how things if you think about paths it's quite a kind of clear way of demonstrating how things can be different and again it's not necessarily the right way it's just a different route or a different path um, and the children tended to resonate with that really really well so they're just some examples of the kind of thing that we do um, in the lesson to talk about as I said before the themes of celebrating difference um, and the difference between things being fair and things being equal um, and in general we did um so we did a few trials um in some schools um in brighton and hope which went really really well they were a big success um and we were lucky enough um to have um sadie um who i mentioned at the beginning of this call um deliver the trial lessons for us in brighton and hope um, and so Sadie is from Brighton and Hove Inclusion Support Service, other, otherwise known as BIS. Um, Sadie is the professional lead for autism for the um, BIS Autism and Language team. Her role includes working with schools across the city, both primary and secondary schools, to ensure that autistic learners' needs are catered, not just around learning, but also around social aspects of school and sensory and emotional regulation. She also leads BIS team of autism specific family support workers. And she links up regularly with colleagues in health, local charities and universities um, to discuss current thinking around autism, how to embed this in their practice. 
And we're really lucky to have been working with Sadie since the inception of this project. Um, and she's been really kind of fundamental to pulling this lesson together. And as I said, delivering the trials. Um, she's also now on the Future Minds Advisory Committee, which we're really excited about. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to pass over to Sadie now um, and to hear from her, her perspective of how the trial lessons went. Thanks, Jess. Um, so I've been really, really excited to be part of this project. It's been a lovely thing to be involved with. I guess for me, I, I do very strongly believe that um, embedding this idea of neurodiversity in children's minds when they're young is a, a, a really great and really important thing to do, and that that will hopefully help us to have a more inclusive and fair society as they grow into adults. I think helping children to understand that difference is, is actually completely normal and in fact, not just normal, but necessary to the growth of ideas and talents of and ways of interacting with the world is, is a fundamental principle that all children should be aware of. Um, and what I loved about this is that we were going to do it in a really fun, engaging and practical way. And I think that's really what, what we achieved in the lessons. Um, they've really been wonderful to be part of. I really, really enjoyed the trial lessons. Um, and they actually, I went away with great hope for the future future. Um, and what's really nice about this lesson is that every child can bring a unique perspective to the lesson. And I guess, you know, as Jess was saying, that's really the point that all our minds work slightly differently. And we, and we all have our unique perspective on life. Um, I was really impressed by how quickly the children grasped the idea of fairness and that they quickly understood that what's fair isn't the same as everybody having the same thing. Um, in the discussions we had, it was it was a real joy to watch them reflect on what helps their brains work best. And it was nice to see how that then linked with so many children identifying with the needs of new neurodivergent classmates because they shared some of the same feelings about what needs to be in place to help them learn best. Many of the children also asked really pertinent questions. So the lesson for me is very much about engaging children um, as active thinkers. And actually, they asked some questions that made me go away, sort of wondering and pondering on things, which was a really lovely and unexpected bonus. And I also felt the staff that watched the lesson, the same happened for them. Um, so that was really, really heartening that they were thinking about things differently, too. So it really was, for me, just a really fun, simple and effective way to spread this incredibly important message that being in a neurodiverse classroom, having neurodivergent classmates or actually being neurodivergent is actually great. Thank you, Sadie. Um, I, I can't um, echo what Sadie said anymore, to be honest. Um, it was such a lovely thing to be part of those trials. Um, and as someone who hasn't typically worked in education, it was absolutely amazing seeing Sadie kind of do her thing in the classroom. And as she said, watch kind of the reaction of the children, but also the reaction of the teachers as well. Um, and it really was an amazing thing, thing to be able to do. Um, and, and as Sadie said, we were enormously impressed by how quickly the children kind of picked up the concept and actually how hopeful we both were when we came out, like Sadie said, for the future, because to them, these were all really, really normal concepts that they were just being taught about and often actually already knew to some degree, um, which was amazing to see. Um, we were in one lesson where one, one small child, before we really got too far into the lesson, you know, said, I have three neurodivergences and listed them off and said, and I'm really proud of them because it makes me who I am or words to that effect. And it was so positive to hear that child be able to kind of have that, like say that in the classroom and to feel supported by their peers. Um, and it, it really was, it really was a lovely thing to, to be able to do. And we can't wait for that to be had in more classes. Um, and here, one of the things that we did, or in the, in, in the when we, one of the things we do in the lesson is we get children after they see the video about how their brains um, work is to think about how their own brain works best. And we get them to write on a post-it um, or a bit of paper kind of what they need to optimize their own learning. Um, and some of the things that they said were amazing. So some of the children were incredibly tuned into what worked for them. Um, and what was really nice was um, as I said, one of the things that we get the children to do was to divide up the fidget toys and then we have another exercise where the fidget toys come back out again and we look at lots of different sensory equipment. But some of the children 
you know, I, I was slightly concerned going into it that we were going to develop a lesson which meant all children were going to want to be able to access everything that neurodivergent children did just because they wanted to rather than needed to. So, for example, fidget toys were all children suddenly going to be demanding fidget toys. But what was amazing in this was that most of or all of the children really were able to recognize that some children needed those fidget toys. Um, and whilst the other children might have liked the fidget toys, it was actually a bit of a distraction for them. And I felt for children that young to be able to tune into that was really, really interesting. And we were able to work with them to understand the difference between what you need and what you want and how for some neurodivergent children, this isn't a case of wanting some of these things. This is just what they need to be able to learn. And, you know, we had some really quirky things um, that people said, and it was amazing to be able to capture them um, and get children to understand what did work for them. And also then to see what worked for their peers. Um, and in theory, you know, that conversation can continue and carry on. And, you know, we, we would like to think that, that the teacher facilitates more of those conversations, that the children can speak amongst themselves um, and that they can continue to think about, you know, what they need um, for their own learning, but also what they might be able to do to support their friends. And not only was it really amazing for the children, as Sadie touched on and as I mentioned, it was really great seeing the teacher's reaction to it. Um, and we have a video to share with you now from one of the teachers where we did the trial lessons um, and she shared her thoughts on what she thought of the lesson. Hi, I am a year six teacher and I was lucky enough to have the neurodiversity lesson at the end of last term. The session was absolutely brilliant. Um, each individual activity was really short, really sharp, really, really active for the children and got each point across in a very physical way that the children could almost see so that there they could then they could understand and what it re what really came out was that the children could see and understand that treating children equally doesn't necessarily mean treating them all the same and that different children and adults need different things in, a, in, in order to be able to learn um, it opened up such amazing discussions, absolutely brilliant discussions, and I think um, would really impact on the way they treated each other and the classroom environment um, and lessons in general. And it helps them to understand why sometimes we make the decisions that we do as teachers and as adults um, in a classroom. It was absolutely brilliant, and I can't wait to have them back again. Thank you so much. So obviously amazing for us to hear the impact um, that that had both from Kirsty and how she believes it impacted the children in her class. So how can schools access the lesson? So we have a number of different ways that um, the teachers and schools can um, access or deliver the lesson um, into classes. Um, so the first um, way is um, we offer something called the Future Minds Ambassador Training. So you can train up to be a Future Minds Ambassador which essentially means that you have all of the skills and we give you all of the resources to be able to teach that lesson in your school. And that training programme is a six week programme. So it's a series of six one hour virtual sessions. Um, and on completion, you will be able to teach that lesson time and time again to um, if you are a uh, kind of teacher to your own class, you can teach to other classes. It's available to SENCOs if they want to kind of teach multiple classes. Um, and we offer that for free. So we'll be running that training program once a term. Um, and as I said, you just need to be available for the uh, hourly sessions. Um, appreciate that um, for, for some of you, um, it will be difficult to come to all of those sessions because there'll be set times. But we ask that you're available for four out of the six sessions and we will record all of them. So if there are ones that you miss, you can watch them back. And even if you don't miss them and you want to go through them again, you can watch them at your own um, in your own time. And those six sessions cover um, some uh, kind of training on neurodiversity. So um, whilst you may well know an awful lot about neurodiversity, you may kind of um, have had previous training. Um, for us to feel comfortable um, to kind of hand over the lesson to people to teach in their own schools, we just have to make sure that some of those basics are covered. So some of it will be on neurodiversity training um, and then some of it will be on actually how to teach the lesson. So we cover 
um, the, the lesson it's in, in its entirety. We cover the, um, the exercises that we go through um, and we kind of and share some of the questions that came up, some of the themes to get across um, that we experienced in the trial lessons. So that's the first way of getting it. And as I said, you can access that for free. You just need to sign up and I'll talk in a second about the, um, the first of those training programmes that's coming up. The second way is um, the Differing Minds team are able to um, deliver that lesson into schools. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, that is um, uh, restricted to two locations just based on where we're based. So we can deliver that into schools in Brighton and Hove and also in Leeds. Uh, but if you're outside of those areas, unfortunately, this time it would only be via the Future Minds Ambassador training that you would be able to access the lesson. Um, so um, the, if, you're, if it's to, to be delivered by the Differing Minds team, it comes at a small cost just to kind of cover our um, logistical costs. Um, I should say that it has been a really core priority for us at Differing Minds and everyone involved in the project to make this lesson accessible to schools um, as much as possible. And that comes down to trying to make it um, free or with very, very little cost. So we are really pleased to be able to offer the training for free. Um, and um, uh, hopefully, you know, a small cost if you aren't able to go down the training route, um, it isn't, isn't too much of an issue. Um, we also have a third way um, that schools can access the lesson, which is under development and um, hoping to release in March 2023 as part of Neurodiversity Celebration Week. So I wanted to give a bit of a flavour of it. And um, we're really excited to be able to offer both, as I said, the Future Minds training programme and also for us to be able to deliver it by the Future Minds, the Differing Minds team. But we're aware that that may come with some barriers. So some teachers, some schools may not have the capacity to take out the time to do the training and you may not have um, the money to fund having the Differing Minds team come in. So for those schools, we wanted to create an option that was entirely accessible and also accessible to teachers who don't necessarily know a lot about neurodiversity and may feel slightly uncomfortable teaching a lesson around it. So what we're creating is a video version of the lesson. So we're creating five um, short videos, they'll be between five and seven minutes long, where they basic, we basically um, show the lesson. So um, it's kind of um, uh, someone teaching it from a screen, um, and we also have some animated videos in there. We also have um, hoping to film some children um, responding to some of the things that children would respond to in the classroom. So such as looking at the optical illusions and sharing their thoughts and things like that. Um, and that series of lessons will come as a pack. So as a teacher, you'd be able to kind of access a facilitator pack, which would tell you a little bit about each of the videos and would support you in facilitating a conversation after each of the videos. So as an example, one of those videos may finish off with the phrase that you heard in one of the videos, which is, how does your brain work best? And then the, as a teacher, all you need to do is work with your class to get them talking about how their brain works best. So we'll give you some examples. So you can say to people, do you like listening to things? Do you like just looking at things? Do you like to use things to fiddle with? Do you like a clear desk? And so as a teacher, you need very little to, to be able to teach that lesson because it's all there for you. Um, and we also have the final video of that. Um, we are filming um, a neurodivergent person um, who was late diagnosed, um, who is going to tell her story um, and we believe will relate really, really well with the children. Um, and so we're really excited about this session. I'm glad to be back. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so as I said, as I hope you heard me say, um, we've released the first dates for our Future Minds um, Ambassador Training Programme, which will start in January 2023, um, and any school member of staff is welcome to attend. Um, you can register your interest by emailing futureminds at differingminds.co.uk, um, and we have limited places available because we want to keep the training um, or the program relatively small so that we can make sure that we equip everyone that's on that um, training program with all of the knowledge that they need to be able to teach the lesson. Um, 
as I said before, recordings will be available for each of these sessions. Um, so you can kind of watch back in your own time. Um, and But we are hoping that you can come to at least four out of the six sessions so that we can kind of pass on information in a, in a live way and not just via online training. Given the sort of somewhat sensitive nature of the topic, um, it's really important for us that people can kind of come to the sessions live and, and take on, on what, what we need them to. So please do send us an email if you're interested in applying. I will um, pause for breath now. Thanks so much for um, kind of listening to um, what we've, we've had to say and to hear us talk about what we've done to get us to the point um, where we are with Future Minds. We're so excited to get this lesson out into as many schools as possible. And we really appreciate your support um, so far in um, kind of coming to this talk, in registering your interest, and we really, really hope to get it out into your schools. So I'm going to uh, check in now to see um, what questions we've had um, come in. Um, Emily and Sadie may well join me to answer some of these questions. So thank you um, for coming back. Hope I didn't scare you too much by my internet dropping. Um, so the first question is, um, is the lesson suitable for children outside of those ages? Um, so I guess this relates to children aged eight to 11. So I'll give my perspective, then I can pass over to see if um, the others have anything to share. So we wanted to focus on that age because we felt like it was a good starting point for us with Future Minds. So I should say that we have intentions to do so much more. Um, we want to develop the lesson for different ages. We want to develop more lessons that go into slightly more depth. Um, but secondary school, we felt would need a little bit more thought. And we wanted to try it with younger children to see how it went before we kind of tackled um, some slight, slightly more challenging environment of secondary school. And also for younger children, you know, they, they are a little bit younger. We might need to kind of tweak it slightly. But um, Sadie and I spoke about this after the trial lessons, and we actually said we wondered um, whether it wouldn't take an awful lot of tweaking for us to teach younger children because of the way that we share these concepts, because of the way that the videos are. Actually, I think that it could reasonably easily be taught to younger children. And if you wanted to teach it to a year three class, for example, I don't think we would have any great issue with this. Likewise, if you wanted to teach it in, in year seven, first year of secondary school, I think it could also work. Um, but just to say that we kind of have plans to open it up a little bit more. Sadie, Emily, I don't know if you want to share any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think you're completely right there, Jess. I think it could easily be adapted up or adapted down. And in fact, the way that we sort of changed from the different year groups was more around the delivery and, you know, the kind of nature of the discussions and some of the ideas that came out. I actually think it could be also really powerful to teach to adults just as it is, because I think it's also a really fun and interactive way of, of adults opening their, their mind about neurodiversity and kind of thinking about different brains. And so, you know, if you become um, an ambassador, it might be something that you also would quite like to do with your staff team, too, because I think it's got a lot of potential there as well. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I think when we did our trial lesson with the adults before it, the adults engaged with it really, really well. And actually it got them thinking in a way. So I think you're right. Whilst we've targeted at those age children, I think it's really relevant to lots and lots of people. And I would say if you're interested in teaching it to different ages, come on the Future Minds Ambassador Training Programme and we can talk about it then. Um, the only reason that we want to make sure that it's targeted at an age group is because it needs to have some boundaries. Um, especially as we teach it. But I think um, once we've, you've gone through the training programme, we'll feel much more confident in kind of your ability to assess what age groups you think is relevant to teach in your own school. So we have one here, um, um, which says, is this only open for teachers? Um, I would love to be able to get involved, but I run a neurodiversity charity for children and young people. Um, firstly, I'm delighted that you would be interested in getting involved. Um, and actually, where this started for us was we wanted to train up Future Minds ambassadors that would act as part of the Differing Minds team. And that's the way that we were going to deliver it into lessons, um, into schools, sorry. And it was only after we did the trials that we actually realised there was an amazing opportunity to train up teachers and so that they could teach it. I think it's absolutely on our radar to expand the Future Minds ambassadors within Differing Minds so that we can then expand beyond those 
um, locations that I talked about, which are essentially where Sadie and I are based in Brighton & Hove and where Emily is based in Leeds. Um, so if you are interested, please do send us an email to futureminds at differingminds.co.uk and, and we can take it from there. Um, and we have one here from um, Yashna. Thank you for sharing. So are there any plans to have a neurodiverse class for teachers as professional development with more depth? Um, so this is a very broad question, and I think this really, I have a sort of Brighton and Hove answer to this and a more nationwide answer. And Sadie's laughing because, um, so a lot of the work that Sadie does at BIS is, is exactly what you've, you've said. So teachers, um, teachers or trains teachers up about neurodiversity. Um, and I think we're actually in a very privileged position in Brighton and Hove um, um, to, to kind of have that here. And I know that that isn't the case in other areas. I'm not sure where you're based and whether you're based in Brighton and Hove or not. Um, but I would say what's been very interesting for us um, is how we've seen um, teachers understand more about it as a byproduct of the lesson. And we're hoping to understand that more and more as we go through the first training programs and see how it's delivered and hopefully work with teachers to understand how that's then kind of improved their understanding. But as I said, there are um, part of the training to be a Future Minds ambassador is around neurodiversity. So I guess it just depends on what you mean in terms of kind of more depth. Um, but um, at this stage, that's what we, we offer. Um, we have someone here who says, I would love to be an ambassador for South Wales. So that's very exciting. Um, again, anyone who's interested, please do send us an email. At the moment, we are um, gathering interest and um, uh, would love to put people on spots for the training program. Um, and we have a question here from Nanda, um, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing names wrong, um, that says, can educational psychologists apply? Um, so again, um, similar to the question before about, is it only open for teachers? Um, you're absolutely welcome to apply in the first instance if you can already teach in a school. So if you're kind of connected to a school, but we do have plans to open this up so that we can train up people. Um, and speaking very candidly, the thing that is um, stopping us from doing that in a big way right now is that it comes with a logistical challenge. So by training up teachers, they then have the skills and the resources to be able to teach it in their own school. Um, by training up people who can kind of work um, from a differing minds perspective, we then still have to do the logistics in terms of finding schools that would want to have the lesson match the people that are in those same areas. Um, and um, uh, differing minds is a not for profit. Um, at the moment, like I said, we're trying to offer this to schools in the most accessible way when thinking about, um, you know, uh, offering it free of charge. So again, absolutely register your interest. Let us know. Um, we would love to gather. Um, Kind of the names and contact details of people and where you could um, teach this lesson for potentially kind of future phases of this project. Brilliant. So, um, sorry, what I'd add to that is there are like Jess has just said there's different phases of the the project and there is a plan that's got about six different phases to it. So yeah, absolutely. If you you know even if you're not kind of under the category of teacher at the moment and um, please do still get in touch and register your interest because when we I mean myself and Jess are quite ambitious when we meet about like we'll do this tomorrow no, no we won't and um, so yeah I mean it might kind of be a while but absolutely if you are interested please please do um, register your interest because the more people that are on board with this the better absolutely yeah totally second that and I think um, just final thing to add on that one is um, we there may be an option to explore if we have people that we train up who kind of operate the logistics themselves. So we don't necessarily maybe you're connected somehow to a school or to a charity that's connected to a school. And maybe we can kind of work through that um, um, together. So yeah, as Emily said, register your interest and we will take it from there. Um, and Nathan has said, how many people are you planning um, in for in the first training sessions? So we haven't 100% decided yet, but it will be somewhere in the region of 15 to 20 places um, to be trained up. Um, we feel like that is a, a great number to be able to train in turn, um, but also keeps it small enough that um, we can kind of facilitate the right level of training um, and kind of cater for Q&A and, and kind of individual needs and things like that. Brilliant. 
So that has timed very well. That brings us, um, we have no more questions coming in. Um, if you do have some questions, again, um, as we've said, either register your interest with us um, um, at futureminds at differingminds.co.uk or equally, if you have any questions, just send us an email and one of us will get back to you. Um, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar. Um, it will also go on to YouTube for anybody to view. So feel free to rewatch or watch some of it if you've missed um, any parts of it. But thank you so much, like I said, um, for your interest in coming along. Thank you so much, Sadie, for today and all of your help to date. Can't wait for our um, next phase of our plans. Pleasure, Jess. And also thanks to Emily, as always. Um, it's been such a pleasure and I'm so delighted to have got to this point. We've been waiting for this, what feels like a long time, but actually we've managed to get here really, really quickly. So really excited for the next phase. Thanks everyone for joining and hope to hear from you soon.